So good evening. Uh, my name is Xiaobo Liu. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 15th NT Wang Distinguished Lecture. The title is The New Approach to U.S.-China Engagement Before It's Too Late. As a former director of Weatherhead East Asia Institute here at Columbia, and uh, currently Ann Whitney Orlin Professor of Political Science at Barnard College, I'm particularly pleased to introduce you to tonight's uh, speaker, tonight's event. This year, our, our feature speaker is Dr. Stephen Roach, a senior fellow at Port High China Center at Yale Law School and former chairman, Morgan Stanley Asia. Before I introduce our speaker, let me first of all say a few words about the, uh, the, lecture, uh, the lecture series and the sponsor today. This year's lecture is hosted by four institute uh, units at Columbia University. Uh, the Weatherhead East Asia Institute, the Jerome Chazen Institute of Global Business at uh, Business School, and also China, the China Center for Social Policy at uh, a School of Social Work, and the Columbia China and World Program at SEPA. So you can see this is a, a widely joint program and a testimony to the importance of the NT Wong uh, Distinguished le uh, Lecture. The series started uh, uh, many years ago in honor of the late uh, Dr. Wang Nianzu, or NT Wong, our longtime friend and colleague, whom I personally knew for many years before he passed away in 2004. It's been hard to believe 20 years. He had nearly, uh, he, he, who was nearly, that's N.T. Wong, nearly half century ago foresaw the economic potential of Chinese economy and recognized the need to promote greater understanding of developments in Chinese economic business relations and their implications. While at Columbia, Dr. Wong spearheaded the China International Business Seminar and, uh, and, and also brought together practitioners, policymakers, academics from around the world to create a new dialogue between government, business, and research communities. During his tenure at Columbia, Dr. N.T. Wong created a vibrant dialogue um, also uh, between China and United, uh, the business and uh, uh, academic communities between United States and China. His legacy continued in the NT1 lecture series, this being the 15th uh, distinguished lecture theory. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Uh, Stephen Roach. Stephen Roach has been a member of the Yale faculty since 2010. After 13 years as a first senior fellow at Yale's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs, he joined Yale Law School Paul Tsai's China Center in 2022. He was formerly chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia and firm's chief economist for the bulk of his 30 year career at Morgan Stanley. A rare combination of thought leadership on Wall Street academia play, uh, uh, and academia placed uh, Stephen Roach in a unique position as a leading practitioner of an analytical macroeconomics. At Yale, he introduced new courses for undergraduates and graduate students on the next China, that's the title of the course, and the lessons of Japan, that's another course. Dr. Roach's current research program focuses on the conflict-prone US-China economic relations. And uh, his latest book, which published uh, in 2022 by Yale University Press, is entitled Accidental Conflict, America, China, and the Clashes of Force Narratives. I'm, 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 I'm sure that all of us are, uh, are very curious about uh, you know, uh, the book and uh, about his um, you know, current research. And uh, he's uh, widely published. Besides his books, he also is a prolific column writer, a column, uh, 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 columnist, and, and, and essay writers in uh, Wall Street Journal, South China Morning uh, Post, uh, interviewed at CNBC and other uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Financial Times. In fact, I got to know him many years ago 
reading his columns in South Morning China Post, which I still keep reading and he still keep publishing. And I'm sure he probably mentioned some of that uh, uh, points in his um, remarks. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, welcome um, uh, Dr. Roche to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shabo. It's a <clears throat> pleasure to be here and uh, an honor to be uh, the 15th uh, individual to um, stand before you as the uh, N.T. Wong Distinguished Lecturer. I can only hope that I am <clears throat> as distinguished uh, as the predecessors, but uh, I'll let you be the, uh, the judge of that. Um, it's also great to be in this brand new building. I have spent many times um, on campus at the old building for the Columbia Business School. And uh, let me just say politely, it was not the most gorgeous building to go into. So by comparison, this is terrific. And um, I'm particularly delighted to be speaking in a, a gorgeous lecture hall. Uh, I guess the, the, the bulk of the funding of which was provided by my dear friend uh, uh, Leon Cooperman, who I've known for probably 45 years. And it's also a pleasure to um, speak to you today uh, in the presence of uh, N.T. Wong's daughter, who I just met for the first time. And um, it's a, a great tradition, and you obviously have much to be proud of in terms of what you're father um, provided in terms of dialogue uh, and um, exchange on the issues between the United States and China. And that takes me to the topic that I want to share with you today. Uh, the, the idea of U.S.-China engagement. In the spirit of N.T. Wong, if I might uh, and be so bold to presume, not being completely familiar with everything he accomplished. Engagement is critical. Uh, and yet, in terms of the U.S.-China relationship, uh, engagement in recent years has become a four-letter word. Uh, if you dare to raise uh, the idea of <coughs> re-engagement, with a country that we had a strong relationship with uh, for um, uh, at least three decades, you are vilified uh, politically uh, and in the, um, the very biased, dare I say, sinophobic uh, media. So I, I'm here to talk to you about why engagement uh, is in trouble. Uh, the stakes uh, that are involved in changing that and my ideas on what it might take uh, to uh, come up with an approach to um, uh, U.S.-China re-engagement. And I close with the, the second uh, sort of pithy aspect of the title re-engagement before it is too late, because we are on a, uh, a very worrisome uh, trajectory, as I will uh, outline. Uh, I, along with many, have stressed uh, the, the very simple and, I would argue, uh, state inarguable uh, statement that the U.S.-China relationship is the most important relationship in the world. Importance in terms of um, economics, uh, politics, uh, and um, uh, geostrategic balance uh, in the world. It is a challenging relationship. It's a relationship that has uh, never stood still. Uh, I, as Shabo said, I, I taught a course for 
13 years at Yale called The Next China. And uh, in the first lecture, I said, look, the, the future is, of course, impossible to predict. But I am going to try to give you the tools to think about where China is headed. And in thinking about it, China, as well as the world in which it inhabits, uh, is constantly changing. So the next China is a moving target. And so is the case with the US-China relationship. The timeline on the right just gives you some of the milestones uh, in the modern relationship uh, that began 50 years ago with uh, President Nixon's shocking trip uh, to China and follows through uh, a relationship that started out innocently. Uh, two nations really uh, experiencing some difficult uh, points in their own modern history. China, uh, at that point, uh, in the throes of the Cultural Revolution, following the instability of the Great Leap Forward a decade earlier, and the US in a wrenching inflation that was to morph into a stagflation, and both economies, both systems, both countries were in need of a new approach, a new solution, and they came to each other uh, in what can be described a marriage of convenience. The more they got to know each other, despite some bumps in the road like 1989, uh, the marriage of convenience uh, morphed into a strong two-way uh, dependency with both nations and their economies relying on one another to sustain uh, their renewal for economic growth. China needed the US uh, consumer uh, as an important source uh, for export-led economic growth and development. China's economy was in terrible shape after two decades of instability, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, uh, and an antidote was needed quickly, and Deng Xiaoping had the vision to grasp uh, that antidote in the form of uh, investment and export-led growth, heavily reliant on external demand from the United States. The US needed a new growth um, approach as well. Income constrained American consumers uh, benefited handsomely from low cost, increasingly high quality Chinese exports. America was on and still is uh, on a binge of open-ended budget deficits that it could not finance with savings at home and the Chinese were willing and able to lend surplus saving to fund our budget deficits. And uh, American manufacturers, uh, while our two biggest export markets were north and south with Canada and Mexico, our third largest and most rapidly growing export market became China. So China needed us, we needed China, and I wrote a book uh, which a young man just asked me to sign uh, earlier, uh, called The Codependency uh, of America and China. It's called Unbalanced, The Codependency of America and China that goes into that two-way uh, relationship in great detail. I borrowed heavily from uh, the pathology of, <laughs> the human pathology of codependency is written in the uh, academic uh, psychology liter literature. And um, I was unsurprised to discover that codependency is an inherently unstable relationship. Partners tend to lose sight of who they are, rely too much on the other, and when the other changes uh, his or her mind, um, strong reaction and conflict arises. 
ultimately, uh, if those sources of conflict are not addressed, a breakup ensues. Now, obviously, it is a stretch for me to put two countries on the couch and analyze them uh, as codependent uh, humans, but read the book. The similarities are striking, and we're now in what I have called the, the conflict phase of codependency, which broke out into the open with the trade war beginning in 2018, quickly followed by a tech war, uh, and now uh, with the early skirmishes of a second Cold War. The thesis that I develop uh, in my writing, um, especially in this latest book, which I hold up here not to sell, but just as an exhibit, uh, that the conflict that we are in right now, the trade war, the tech war, the early stages of the Cold War, would not have happened were it not for the false narratives that both nations hold with respect to each other. And just a, a brief um, comment on uh, false narratives. Why do we embrace false narratives? Why can't we just face up uh, to the way it is? And, and I trace that to the toxic politics of blame that comes from a, um, a codependent relationship uh, that has gone wrong. And I <laughs> draw your attention to what I call my Yale colleague Robert Schiller's fifth narrative, fifth proposition of narrative economics. He's written a book on narrative economics. His fifth proposition is that the false narrative becomes so deeply embedded in the discourse, the public discourse, that even if you fact check it uh, and expose the narrative for being false, the legacy of the false impression endures long after it is corrected uh, by the fact checkers. Sounds abstract, but think about what we're doing two weeks from tomorrow. The big lie endures today, even though it has been disproved over and over again. Um, two examples. The book has eight chapters on false narratives. I try to be uh, fair. <coughs> Four chapters on America's false narratives of China, four on China's false narratives of the US. But let me just highlight um, one on each side. Uh, in the exhibit you see in the upper right, uh, it is a, um, whoops, I didn't switch, switch the, yeah, I did, okay. I think it's up there so high, I can't even see it. And it's, a, it's a table that is designed um, that even on a screen this large, it's almost impossible to read. So take my word for it. What it shows is just for last year, the 106 countries that the US ran merchandise trade deficits with. The way the false narrative works is it usually starts with a fact. Yes, we have a big trade deficit. But then the fact gets distorted for political purposes. And the biggest piece of our trade deficit, yes, is with China, although that piece has come down sharply due to tariffs. But by higher math, that leaves 105 other countries that we run trade deficits with. We run a multilateral trade deficit with 106 nations because we don't save. And when we don't save as a nation and we want to grow, we import surplus savings from abroad, run enormous balance of payments and multilateral trade deficits to attract the capital. So again, 
we start uh, with a small shred of a fact and it gets blown up for political purposes to pin the blame on China. China is unfortunately guilty of the same thing. Um, lower right, uh, China's rebalancing challenge. China saves too much, spends too little, the opposite of the United States. Uh, and that lack of spending is now widely recognized uh, as a serious structural impediment to Chinese economic growth. Fact, true. I'll go back to that in a second. But Xi Jinping, two years ago, on the sidelines of the National People's Congress, uh, blamed the United States and its policies of containment for China's uh, structural uh, uh, problems uh, and its lack of balance. Again, fact followed by uh, exaggeration. Now, the theory of accidental conflict, if you want to call it a theory, is to pull together the false narratives on both sides of the relationship. America's false narratives of China, China's false narratives of China, and to think about that uh, as really being the functional equivalent of the high octane fuel of conflict escalation. High octane fuel is easily con combustible by the slightest spark. And there are plenty of sparks uh, that are bearing down on this combustible fuel right now. Taiwan, South China Sea, the war in Ukraine, and China's role as Russia's partner without limits, and then America's containment uh, efforts directed at China, uh, reflecting the overwhelming bipartisan sentiment against China at a record chart in the upper right, uh, and um, congressional hearings uh, that are aimed at China as an adversary, lower right, by the so-called House Select Committee on the CCP, that are uh, more contentious in dress addressing uh, a former partner as an adversary than anything we've seen since the red baiting of the 19, early 1950s. The clash between the two economic superpowers uh, certainly qualifies uh, as getting considerable attention as a potential spark to accidental conflict as well. Two versions of looking at that. Uh, the version that economists like myself uh, like to look at the most on the top uh, based on adjusting the share, the global share of both economies uh, for differences in living standards through what we call PPP or purchasing power parity and the dollar-based measure uh, on the lower portion of this chart which rises and falls uh, with uh, the translation of economic uh, output in both nations into US dollars and therefore is heavily sensitive to swings in um, uh, foreign exchange markets. As I said, the version on the top is actually more accurate, but the version on the bottom uh, certainly is more aligned with public sentiment of the coming convergence and then more recently of the possibility that China may never make it uh, to the level of the US. And China's economic challenge uh, is just worth a brief uh, digression here because it, it certainly does have an impact on uh, the possibility of convergence with the U.S. and on the perceptions that the Chinese have of their own economic uh, strength. 
And you can see on this graph on the right, it's actually pretty stunning. Uh, for um, 32 years, the Chinese economy, economy grew at 10 percent. And if the IMF's forecast is to be believed, and I think it's as good approximation as any of the future, uh, over the um, six-year period, 2024 to 2029, that average growth rate is going to slow below, slightly below 4%. A deceleration of six percentage points reflecting cyclical pressures, structural pressures, and an outcome that poses a profound challenge uh, to the aspirational objectives uh, that Xi Jinping has laid out for the centennial year of 2049. Whoops. It's a busy chart, uh, and I'll start to move a little more quickly because I'm sensitive to time. Um, the China slowdown uh, is getting a huge amount of attention today. Finally, in Beijing, but also in world financial markets. There's a lot of noise on this chart. Just look at the thick black line on the left. It's a five-year moving average of the Chinese growth rate, actual again and projected by the IMF. The five-year growth rate peaked at 11.7% in 2007. And by the IMF's forecast, that number will be eight percentage points slower uh, in the five years ending in 2029. Again, a confluence of cyclical uh, pressures, especially uh, in the property sector, uh, but also the squeeze on the private sector in China, uh, but also serious uh, long-term structural head headwinds uh, driven by demography, uh, weak productivity, uh, and the geopolitical tensions of the U.S.-China uh, conflict. This raises a question that I've written about and having taught um, courses for a number of years on China and Japan, uh, I am increasingly uh, worried about uh, what these two stories have in common rather than the differences. There are obviously differences between China uh, and Japan. Uh, but my point is, in comparing uh, the deceleration from the high growth era in both uh, China and Japan, the deceleration, the two bars on the far right, is virtually identical. Six percentage points uh, uh, of um, compression in GDP growth uh, from high to slow growth in both economies. And that raises, uh, I think, a fair question as to whether or not uh, China uh, will be susceptible to the same type of lost decade syndrome that has gripped Japan now for three decades. It seems to finally uh, be over, but it may be too soon to tell. Now, just stop at this point for a second. I don't want you to think I am emphatically pounding the table and telling you that uh, China is the next Japan. But the similarities are too worrisome uh, to ignore. And I have written publicly a couple of weeks ago in the Financial Times that because of those similarities, that Beijing policymakers uh, should err on the side of acceptance of the Japanese prognosis rather than uh, stay stuck uh, in denial. And so I think it's appropriate to then look at the policy stimulus that has been um, unveiled uh, in Beijing in recent weeks through the template of a similar approach that was used to address 
the policy problems in Japan, known as Abenomics, named after the late former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, which had three pieces to the approach, or what Abe called three arrows, basically monetary, fiscal, and structural. And on September 24th of this year, uh, the People's Bank of China unleashed a powerful uh, monetary stimulus that caused an immediate, sharp uh, upward adjustment in the Chinese equity market, you can see in the upper right. And uh, I was talking to one of my dear friends, Lulu Wong, about this before we sat down uh, this afternoon. And um, yeah, I'm certainly impressed, as are uh, investors around the world, but especially uh, in China, that you know this was a, at its height uh, a 30 percent rebound. Uh, but I would just point out, in looking at this chart, uh, it's now only a 25 percent rebound, but it's still big. But it's still about 32 percent below uh, the highs it in February 2021. And I just draw your attention to the numbers on the far right and look at uh, the tendency of the Japanese stock market, which experienced a world record bear market in the 1990s, falling 66% from peak to trough. And in four instances during that descent, there were sharp rebounds that we painfully call dead cat bounces that averaged uh, 34%. Too early to say that this is a dead cat bounce in the Chinese equity market, but um, to the extent that the Japanese template is worth uh, considering, think about that. So my verdict on uh, Chinese policy is that um, the big stimulus that's been announced certainly qualifies as powerful from the first arrow monetary perspective, um, a little iffier from the second arrow fiscal perspective, and missing in action from the structural perspective, the third arrow, uh, strikingly reminiscent of the same a uh, problem that uh, Japan confronted repeatedly during its lost decades. Now, I'm definitely going on too long, so, but I'll, I'll be a little quick here. Um, I started out with talking, you, uh, talking to you today about false narratives and arguing that the false narrative is partially fact-based, but then gets uh, distorted through political, the political expedience of blame. And unfortunately, what's happening now is that the false narrative uh, is losing its mooring uh, as a fact-based framework to assess relationship conflicts. Uh, the facts have given way to lies. And I'll just cite, without going into it, uh, and we can talk about this in the Q&A if you want, uh, the allegations that have been made by very senior uh, US officials uh, about the threats from Chinese electric vehicles, the so-called backdoor from Huawei's 5G telecommunication platform, uh, a quote, bolt typhoon, uh, hacking effort, uh, the fear that uh, Chinese-made um, uh, dock-loading cranes represent a dire threat to American security, and of course, TikTok. Uh, it's going to take over the minds of uh, innocent American teenagers. My point is that all of those things could happen but there's no evidence that they will happen. We are conflating uh, our assessment 
of our adversaries capacity to attack uh, with the intent to strike. Uh, we're making cases based loosely on circumstantial evidence uh, without relying on hard evidence. Uh, this puts us in the danger zone of what I've called a sinophobia. Now, let's get to the punchline, the way out. The conventional wisdom is leave it up to the leaders. Diplomacy is the way out. And you know, I'm a big fan of diplomacy, uh, but I don't think it's enough. Leader-to-leader uh, -leader meetings are long on theater, but typically short on substance. Uh, this is a classification of different types of leader-to-leader -leader summits. The one in the red uh, last um, uh, year's meeting in San Francisco, or actually Woodside, California, just south of San Francisco, uh, gets a lot of uh, support, is offering a new vision for collaboration. Uh, I think the PR is good, but the actual deliverables uh, are disappointing. Uh, again, diplomacy is absolutely essential. It was in the beginning of this relationship, and it's worked uh, very well from time to time uh, when we've had to deal uh, with difficult issues. But it has failed uh, to avoid uh, the type of conflict escalation that we are now in the grips of. And so, the new approach that I will leave you with today uh, that is developed uh, in my latest book uh, has three legs to the stool. One, facing up to distrust uh, by uh, working on uh, first easy and then increasingly tougher issues that we have in common. Secondly, getting rid of this zero-sum uh, conflict that has been framed around a bilateral trade deficit. And thirdly, uh, coming up with a new framework, a new architecture of engagement that brings together uh, diplomacy, which has to continue, uh, with a new mechanism uh, of institutional uh, engagement. And let me just um, briefly take you for that. Trust. There are definitely some easy things that can be done, like reopening foreign consulates, Chengdu in China, Houston in the United States, loosening up visa restrictions. Some of that has been done. Um, restarting educational exchanges. We need to restart the Fulbright program. You can't get it through the US Congress. Relaxing constraints on non-governmental organizations, tougher to do, but essential uh, to rebuild uh, the discourse between societies. There are tougher issues higher up on the trust tree Climate, health, cybersecurity, uh, I, I, maybe it's an exaggeration, but I think uh, our progress uh, is limited best on all three of these fronts. Without trust, we won't get anywhere, but it's going to take um, the courage of leaders acting individually or collectively to rebuild trust. Secondly, um, when I talk, spoke to you about the false narratives of um, US-China trade, uh, the point there is that bilateral trade deficits uh, 
give you the wrong inference in terms of uh, policy prescriptions. And so it's a, it becomes a zero-sum focus. And we did that uh, with the phase one trade deal that was struck by the uh, former president in July 2000, uh, which he called uh, the greatest trade deal uh, in recorded history. But he sort of called all of his deals that. Uh, but basically, it was a deal where China uh, would promise to buy $200 billion of incremental um, U.S. exports over a two-year period. The two years came and went, and China missed the target, the $200 billion target, by $200 billion. Uh, and the trade deficit multilaterally grew. I'm in favor of not a zero-sum bilateral deal, but a reduction of investment barriers in both countries framed around a bilateral investment treaty. We were this close to completing negotiations on one in late 2016. It's completely off the table now. And then finally, the piece that I'm actually uh, most excited about is a new architecture uh, of engagement framed around what I call, for lack of a better term, a US-China secretariat. This is the new mechanism uh, that I think is needed to complement ongoing diplomacy. Unlike leader-to-leader -leader engagement or earlier um, or big um, uh, event um, annual exercises like the strategic and economic dialogue that were long on glitz but short on substance, uh, a U.S.-China secretariat is a full-time uh, focus uh, by an organization equally staffed by professionals, technocrats if you want to call them, call them that, uh, located in a neutral venue, not getting together once or twice a year, but operating 24 by 7 full time on all aspects of the US-China relationship, from economics and trade to technology, innovation, technology transfer, subsidies to um, state-owned enterprises, industrial policy in the United States, and the big ex mega quasi-existential issues uh, like climate, health, cybersecurity, human rights. Uh, and the Secretariat would be uh, empowered to work in a collaborative fashion, developing policy white papers uh, that are inserted into the legislative process of both nations. The Secretariat would be uh, empowered with a dis dispute screening mechanism uh, to monitor existing and new agreements that are struck between the two nations and to address the inevitable disputes that will arise on a fact basis as opposed to on a political basis. So that's my plan. Trust, uh, opening, and opening markets and reducing investment barriers and augmenting diplomacy with an institutionalized mechanism that I call uh, a secretariat. Uh, I wrote this book several years ago. It was published in late 2022. Uh, I was 
and worried about where a dysfunctional relationship <clears throat> is headed. I am far more worried today than I was when I wrote the book. As I said at the outset, uh, engagement, uh, especially in this country, has become a four-letter word. And the Chinese certainly have a role to play uh, in this conflict as well. And my book is as even-handed as possible in pointing this out uh, to uh, my friends in China uh, as well. Doesn't always go over well in Beijing, but it goes over a lot better there than it does in Washington. And so here we sit, you know, two weeks from tomorrow, in theory, we get a new government. Will it have the courage and the vision uh, to cast aside uh, the poisonous politics and deal with the risks of accidental conflict before it's too late? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, <clears throat> Let me open up the question and answer uh, period by asking a question um, about the community that you're familiar with, that is the U.S. business community and its role in this overall picture as you see it, um, pessimistic as you are. How does, because if we recall, U.S. business community always played a quite a positive role in U.S.-China overall relations, right, uh, over the last, what, 50 years or so. But recently, you probably share my observation that their voice has kind of become quieter, if not, you know, a lot, lot, lot quieter than before. Yesterday I was reading, I think some of you may notice, may not notice, a minor piece of news. Actually, it's not, I mean, to me, it's quite major. It's about this uh, lack of IV uh, fluid in North Carolina because the, the, the Hurricane Baxter, that's the major. Uh, U.S. international IV fluid maker, uh, that facility in North Carolina was de de damaged, and it's going to take a lot of time. So all of a sudden, U.S. has this shortage. It's very weird. A very shortage of IV fluid, of all things. And yesterday was reported FDA approved the emergency measure by Baxter to ship, actually to fly, you know, 200 Boeing flights gonna, in the next few weeks, from all over the world. And I was reading it and said, oh, from overseas. So I wonder about China, because again, this is always, we, you know, you've been talking about decoupling, right, about this. And indeed, China was one of them, because Baxter, you know, actually had a, a plant in China. So this brings me to the question, observation that, you know, US China's economic sort of codependency or that kind of tie becomes so entrenched and deep that any kind of decoupling measures would not go too well. But then that kind, this kind of example is very rare lately. You know, you hear about, you give a lot of examples, I completely agree about TikTok, about anything. You haven't mentioned land. You know, a lot of states were now even banned Chinese to buy land. I don't know why that is. I mean, I, another thing I also false narrative, I may add, is that Anything that China do, or Chinese do does is because China. So Chinese private behavior becomes private uh, company or individual's behavior always become part linked to this overall China. You know, meaning that behavior probably regard as national security. So that is another false narrative I would add to that, meaning the lack of distinction between what is a private behavior of the Chinese, even the ethnic Chinese, be, you know, uh, uh, you know, American behavior than in China, because that is sometimes can lead to that xenophobia uh, 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 problem. So anyway, so my question is, what do you think about the U.S.-China's business? Is this decoupling is so successful that the U.S. business community would not have a, that kind of a powerful, positive role in bringing this together, bringing, you know, sort of closer or the sustain this relationship? 
well as a <clears throat> former senior Wall Street executive operating in uh, China for a number of years and living <clears throat> in Hong Kong for five years as the chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, I'm fully aware of the strong role that the U.S. business community has long had historically uh, in standing up for U.S.-China relations. We like to view and characterize um, the economic complementary and integration of our two systems as the anchor of our relationship. Well, that anchor has been lifted. Uh, and the silence of the American business community is deafening. Mm. There is a fear to speak out lest you be vilified by the political forces that are so solidly um, aligned against virtually any of the touch points that China has with the United States. I'm old enough to have been alive, although I can't say I remember uh, the early 1950s. The McCarthy hearings, I've studied it, I've written about it, read about it. Um, and a, a lot of um, American lives were destroyed by the red baiting that occurred uh, in the halls of the US Congress, led by ultimately censured Senator Joseph McCarthy from the state of Wisconsin. What worries me the most in hearing your question is that we, we like to say that the conflict is really between the two governments yeah. and the people still feel um, very close and trusting and respectful of one another. The longer the government-led conflict continues, the greater the risk, I think, that we do damage to the people-to-people -people, uh, relationship. Businesses, to your point, are intermediaries mm. between the government uh, and the political uh, legislative uh, views. And they're afraid to speak out. And I do worry, you know, as we have cut back uh, the activity of um, uh, NGOs, as the number of Chinese students studying, excuse me, American students studying in China, but also Chinese students studying in the US, uh, but especially the former, has plunged. Uh, that that uh, could ultimately be the, the gravest damage of, of all. So again, uh, we need to take action uh, before it is too late. Your follow-up question will be, or should be, okay, which one of these two candidates is going to take action? <laughs> And I'll briefly answer the question I Great. <laughs> put in your mouth. Don't count on, you might have gathered from some of the side remarks I've made, don't count on that coming from Donald Trump. Ooh. He's going to lead with tariffs. It's an old movie. We've seen it before. He has no understanding of what a tariff is, who pays for it, and what its ramifications are. Uh, Kamala Harris, there is no real reason to believe at this point that she is going to uh, make a sharp break from the China policies of Joe Biden. And that, it's not as problematic as Trump's view, but it's not great. Because if you recall, in 2020, when um, Joe Biden won, there was great hope that he would reverse 
Trump's um, policies on China. And in early 2021, when he took office, he didn't do that. He ended the border wall construction, the Muslim travel ban, he rejoined the Paris Agreement on Climate, World Health Organization, but kept the noose very tight around China. And if anything, through the small yard or high fence national security focus has tightened the noose. So Kamala Harris would have to break from the, uh, the Biden-China legacy. Could she do it? I have no idea. I wrote an article a few weeks ago that got a lot of attention um, where I said, what would it take for Kamala Harris to be the next Richard Nixon? And I actually got a lot of response because I made the point that her running mate, Tim Walz, actually knows something about China as an educator, but not you know, as a businessman. And, and he has a more, much more nuanced view of China. Now, we all know the vice presidents never do anything, but maybe he could have an impact. So I you know, created a bad dream and a good dream scenario. Uh, and I did send copies of it to the um, Harris campaign. I have yet to receive a response. All right, so let's open for a couple questions. Um, any, anyone uh, want to ask questions? Okay, so maybe, yeah, we can, we can use that. Yeah. So identify yourself, very brief. Oh, okay. Thank you, Professor Roach. My name is Tina. I'm a CPAR student here. Um, thank you very much for your sharing. You said you are worried and you're pessimistic. Actually, I think you are very op op optimistic because you point a way out, a roadmap to re-engagement and new engagement. Um, but there is another school of thinking is that the conflict between US and China is structural and uh, the conflict inevitable between two super, uh, superpowers. Have you ever seen a past example of the um, peaceful coexistence between two superpowers? And what make you think that US and China can make it happen if the leaders on both sides use wisdom? Well, the, um, the most powerful advocate of um, coexistence um, Henry Kissinger is no longer with us. But that was his hope. Uh, and yet, I very much shared the fears he expressed late in life that the US and Con uh, China were in um, what he said five years ago, in the foothills of a new Cold War, which he then updated to say that they have moved well beyond the foothills. He was very, very worried. And I actually did <coughs> run a draft of my book uh, by him, and we discussed it. And you know, his view was that the politics needed to be addressed before the structural mechanism for re-engagement, but he was very much in support of the type of framework that I offered with trust, market opening, and a new mechanism uh, for ongoing continual engagement. But he had no answer, nor do I, for the political dysfunctionality that has broken out like a virus in this country. And you know, I go back to the point I've made a few times, you know, two weeks from tomorrow, we'll see where the virus, we'll get a quick upread on the virus, but it's hard to be optimistic that America uh, is going to come to its senses uh, and recognize uh, the dangers of where our politics of blame and with respect to China 
Sinophobia based on lies is going. Uh, I wish I could be more optimistic than that, but I take Kissinger's point that until we can really um, correct uh, and rid ourselves of the poison of the political discourse, this program is not going to have a great chance. Professor Roach, I have a uh, general question linked to a particular question. Uh, you are pretty unique in your outlook toward uh, U.S.-China relations. Could you mention the names of folks in academia, business, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, um, other sectors of public life who are either actual or potential allies of your point of view? That's the general question. The particular question is, do you see, assuming a uh, Democrat win in two weeks, that Tim Waltz will have an actual influence on national policy vis-a-vis -vis China. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I am committed to uh, in from, from my narrow perch is to participate uh, through my position at the Paul Tsai China Center of the Yale Law School uh, with my colleagues, not all of whom are like-minded, but certainly share broad goals that I have outlined to you today, and participate in discussions that we hold at Yale with counterparts in China. And we, we simply believe that exchange and engagement on a fact-based uh, analytical perspective is absolutely essential to find a way out. Are we making progress? Some. But are we getting to the big issues that I just alluded to? The political discourse? No. I also participate and have done so for 15 years in a more formal uh, track to dialogue sponsored on the U.S. side by the U.S.-China Business Council um, and a group on the American side who I will not name. I know you asked me to name names, but um, I will not violate uh, the confidence of my colleagues. We've worked together for 15 years uh, with uh, a, a collection of extraordinary counterparts on the Chinese side. And we met um, for the last time in, in June. And I will be going back to Beijing in three weeks uh, to keep the effort going. And I think track two dialogues are absolutely essential when governments are at odds. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is we fail because look at the conflict. But without track two dialogues, senior people uh, really engaging in a fully transparent and trusting fashion, we have no hope. Tim Waltz. I wrote about him. Um, I don't know him. I do know that um, it became sort of part of the political theater uh, as whether or not he was you know, in China in June of 1989 or not. Uh, I think he misspoke. Uh, but he certainly was in the area uh, at around, in a very difficult time. Uh, and that always, 
I think has been an important uh, aspect of his memory in China. Now, and he's focused a lot on human rights issues uh, uh, ever since. I think he was married uh, June 5th of 1994. Uh, his wife said, well, he didn't want to forget the date. Um, but I think there was some deep meaning there. On the other hand, he has stated strongly his support of in the relationship between the United States and China in the broad sense, but he has been very clear in his con ongoing concerns on human rights issues, Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, even most recently, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and so he brings a nuanced view of China, <clears throat> hopefully to a new administration that needs that. And if Kamala Harris is going to be the next Richard Nixon from the standpoint of rethinking China, the nuance is going to be very important. One more question, and then... Uh... Okay. Can, can I? Oh, Two more um, hi, yeah. Professor Roach. Thank you so Already much for the talk. Time, but, um, yeah, sorry, yeah, just sure. very quick question. So for younger generation like, uh, oh, sorry. So my name's Liam. I'm, I'm a first year student at SIPA, the policy school. So for younger generations like ourselves who grew up in a, a more globalized um, uh, world, which is now fragmenting to pieces, uh, what recommendations would you give to uh, people like us, Chinese Americans, ethnic Chinese in America, or Americans in China, about how to deal with this kind of toxic uh, superpower rivalry. Like how uh, people like us who are globalized individuals, how should we um, deal with an environment that's increasingly becoming kind of 1950s? I guess that's the question I have for you. Thank you. I, I don't have an easy answer for that, other than to say that. Um, Geostrategic oh, okay. rivals, rivalries, uh, are, with all due respect, for a, a young, committed, hardworking student, and your, and, and others of your ilk right now, think of them as being above your pay grade. You just don't want to get. It's not that you don't want to get involved, but there's very little you can do to have an impact uh, on the broad political forces. So if you pick an issue that you're interested in, you know, a relatively smaller issue, um, that allows you to look at the trees rather than being overwhelmed by the forest, uh, I suspect you will find something that you can grab onto and make a lot of progress on. You know, whether it's a company, a sector, uh, uh, a smaller conceptual issue that seems to be in, in dispute, develop your expertise uh, and find your counterparts for Chinese Americans in this country and for Americans uh, living in China. And I have right now one of my uh, most um, promising uh, Yale graduates um, in recent years as a Shoresman Fellow in, living in Beijing. And um, I have another young woman in the class after him who is going to be a Shoresman Fellow the following year. And I, they've asked me the same thing. And I've given them, hopefully, the same answer. Uh, find relatively smaller and manageable areas of overlap uh, and build relationships uh, with your contemporaries. Uh, and I think you will find uh, over time that will be rewarding, I hope.